Well, thanks so much for having me on the call tonight. And uh, I just wanted to applaud the work that Disability Labour and Disability Equality at Labour have been doing alongside DPAC over the last five years, certainly since I've been in Parliament. And it's been a quite a dark time. And we know what's happened with the rhetoric in the media and also used by the Conservative Party when they went from trying to blame the economic situation that many of our communities found themselves on scroungers and they were asking us to blame everybody but the Tory party for the situation that we found ourselves in. So we're in very, very dangerous times and the election result was an absolutely devastating blow to everybody. I was crushed by it and I'm sure that everybody who's gonna be watching this tonight felt exactly the same way because we had a manifesto that had the right answers to the right questions. But unfortunately, we've got to recognise that there were things that went wrong in that general election campaign. And I think messaging was one of them. We didn't speak to our communities in a way that resonated with them. And we didn't explain that many of the things that were within our manifesto were there to make people's lives better and to empower them. Now, in terms of why I'm here, I got my politics from my experiences growing up. I've learned my politics sitting at the top of the stairs, listening to my dad when he came home from work. He was a trade union representative and heard about the struggles that he faced at work, whether it was pay disputes or redundancies. And then later, when I got my first Saturday job, I went to work in a pawnbroker's. And I remember then, because it was the early 90s, being quite shocked at the way that people were being treated and cast aside. And you could see what it meant when the government washes its hands of its people. And those that can't barely make ends meet are having to force themselves to pawn their family heirlooms and possessions just to get by. And the sad fact is, is that we've got an even worse situation brewing at the moment. The government lost its appeal today on human rights grounds about transferring people onto universal credit who were disabled, who were moving into other areas. We have the story of the terrible man who starved to death because of what he was inflicted, uh, what was inflicted on him by the Department for Work and Pensions. And these aren't stories in isolation. Unfortunately, we've all seen I, Daniel Blake, and as a constituency MP in Salford, I'd say one of the major things that comes through my office door are those who were appealing PIP assessments or trying to tell me about how savage work capability assessments are. And I've been absolutely astounded as an MP to hear what people have gone through and how dehumanising it is. So in terms of my overall pitch, I'll focus specifically on the things that I wanted to do to support disabled people in the party. And there's two strands to it. There's the policy side, and there's also what we need to do with our party structures to make sure that we've got better representation. And access to meetings is the first thing. One of the things that always strikes me, certainly being in Salford, is that we have a meeting venue that it does have a lift in it, but it seems to kind of, it segregates our disabled members who have to go to another end of the building they have to be escorted and it's very much a bit of a scene that's created when we have to get them in and out of the building and we're in a luxurious position as a constituency party that actually has access for people who can't get upstairs and I think there needs to be training within our party for constituency chairs and treasurers and all of the other officers to make sure that they're choosing venues that are accessible to everybody Secondly, I think that we should be examining things like Zoom calls like this. I know that there's a couple of constituency parties that are trialling them already and they seem to work very well. And I have to say, when I've been doing Zoom calls, I thought, thought they were a fantastic thing, even though I don't really understand what I'm doing properly with them yet. But how you can get so many members onto a call who can't leave the house. And it's not just about disabled members either. It's about recognising that a lot of our members just can't get out to meetings. They've got commitments, they've got to look after family members, but they still want to participate in our policy making process and in our meetings going forward. So we've got to work with disability labour, I think, whoever the leader is, to find those creative solutions. The second thing is on conference, because obviously I've been on the NEC for a few years and I've heard the stories about how bad the, I think it was a 2017 conference was, particularly for not addressing accessibility requirements. And then even though we'd made some progress since then, and I know that Disability Labour done some fantastic work with our officers at Southside, even in 2019, there was a crowdfunding attempt to get people from Disability Labour to go to the conference, which made it appear that as a party, we weren't seeing 
you know, our representatives there as an integral part of our officer framework, and that should never have been the case. So we need to make sure that the party can help out with supporting uh, those things going forward. And then the last point on party democracy is about representation, really. I know that it, there was the motion passed at conference to make sure that we had an NEC place that was designated for disabled people's representation, but nothing seems to have happened with that and it hasn't been elected yet. And I think we need to speed that up and make sure that happens. But also in constituencies, the disabled officer role has always been, and not in every CLP, but I'm just kind of going from my own experience. It's seen as a bit of a luxury position. It's like, oh, we'll have one if we want, but we're not that bothered about it, as opposed to a trade union officer. Oh, yeah, we've got to have a trade union officer. And I think there needs to be that weight thrown behind it as a vital officer position within all constituencies. And that goes down to training your executive within your constituencies, really, to make sure that that role is really, really filled and it provides a supportive base for all people in the constituency who might want to organise or might want to have that level of representation. On the policy side of things, there's a few things that I wanted to cover. Then the first thing, and this goes down to the messaging in our campaign, really, we were seen very much as a party that gave handouts. And that was on the back of, it wasn't the, what we wanted to sound like, but it wasn't on the back of a lot of the narrative and the messaging that had been going out over the last four years. So instead of us rebranding social security and trying to explain to our communities what it was actually there for and what its role was, many of our community members saw us as, a, as an organisation that provided handouts and that didn't help anyone within our communities that has to you know, use social security and should be quite proud of that fact. So we need to take away the negative connotations that have developed, not just in the last 10 years under this government, but certainly over the last 40 years, because it's been a project in the making, unfortunately, this shift towards trying to demonise and give negative connotations to the welfare state and social security. So it needs to be rebranded in my view. The second point is supporting a lot of the principles within our manifesto, which I was proud of. So scrapping universal credit, scrapping work capability assessments which are dehumanizing and degrading quite frankly and also making sure that we scrap benefit sanctions as well we've all got stories to tell about people that have suffered terribly life-changing consequences from being sanctioned there was one guy in my constituency who was diabetic and he ended up being so ashamed and not being able to tell his family that he'd been sanctioned because he wasn't capable of working. He'd been assessed as being capable of working and he wasn't. So he didn't ask for help. And then in the end, because he wasn't regulating himself, he ended up having one of his legs amputated because that's yeah. how serious it got. And we've got to make sure that people are told these stories and that we scrap the system entirely because this is not what you expect from a civilised society. And most people don't understand the scale of what's happening. And I think most MPs, particularly Labour MPs, should be trying to gather data as to what's happening in their own constituencies. Is what we're trying to do in Salford to show the, show the scale of the problem, really. Um, and then the last point was about some of the work that Disability Labour have been doing about promoting a bit of a rebrand of social care, if you like, into an independent living service. And this goes hand in hand with rebranding social security and care overall about empowering people to live the best life that they possibly can. And rather than calling it care, you know, calling it an independent living service, how in trying to make your life aspirational so that you can live the best quality of life possible. If you can, you know, access work, that's great and you should be empowered to do that. But if not, then you should be given that quality of life that you deserve. And then the last point, if we'll forget this one as well, is housing. And I think that's a critical point, um, you know, both in terms of council housing and social housing not being available to many within our community who need accessible housing and are being put in situations where they're struggling because they're not in adequate housing, as well as making sure that through the private sale and rented sector, that more weight is given to providing those homes that are accessible and fit for purpose, really, so that, again, in people from the disabled community are empowered to live the fullest life possible and they have the same quality of life as everybody else so that's a, a little bit of a pitch really i won't go off into all of the other uh, <laughs> economic stuff i'll be here all night if i start talking about the crisis of capitalism and the green industrial revolution and everything that needs to happen but any specific questions you've got on that do let me know okay becky thank you for that um 
in your pitch, you've actually decimated some of my question list. <laughs> <laughs> So let's go back at least to the beginning and let's pick up just want to pick up some of the things that you said. You yeah. talked about accessibility for CLP meetings. It's our CLP nomination meeting this evening. Now I'm not there, I'm sitting here interviewing you and I did my pitch and said please can I have a proxy bit and we can be told Nope, there's been nothing come down from the NEC, which there should have been, and we were told would happen for exceptional circumstances for people to get proxy votes for the, for the yeah. customs meetings. Do you accept that we have got to be able to have either online voting um, proxy votes or postal votes for all internal elections? Yeah, and I, I think in this day and age, if we can have an online election for our leadership election, then there's no reason why we can't have it for our constituency meetings as well. And as I say, I mean, we can trial this and we can work hand in hand with disability labour to look at all the different options that are available. But if we're able to have a Zoom call tonight, then there's no reason why we can't live stream our meetings to many of our members who can't get there. And it's not just an issue of those who can't physically get to meetings because there's no access it's about anybody who can't get to a meeting yeah. and I think more participation because one of the things that we always get in the Labour Party we've got like nearly 2,000 members in Salford but at any one time we probably get 50 people at a meeting and it's because who wants to leave the comfort of their own warm home on a Thursday night so we've got our nomination meeting tonight as well um, to, to go to a meeting when they've got so much else on in their lives whereas if they could just log on for an hour and listen to their MPs report and everything that's going on they'd be totally involved and they'd be able to participate and you can do like questions on zoom calls as well I haven't figured this out but I know you can type them in as well so there's there's more ways to, to really be engaged yes you certainly can um, do questions via zoom um, I actually chaired one of my branch meetings via Zoom a few weeks back when I was really, really ill and could not leave the house at all. Um, and my branch were really lovely. I'm the chair of the branch. So it was actually quite interesting to try and chair from not being in the room, but it yeah. actually worked. I was really surprised how well we made it happen and it was really good in the end. So, yeah. Well, I think one of the things with that is we need to be pushing it from the top of the Labour Party because with the disability officer position, um, the amount of pushback that you got around the country from CLPs who said that their constitutions wouldn't allow it and then still pushing forward with the fact that they'll have meetings in pubs which is an inclusive to a lot of people yeah. and the fact that anything that people do for us disabled people would work for anybody else who has an issue either with attending meetings or not being able to can canvas we've had in our disability activist guide to the labor party which we've just had at the last Labour Party conference, we have a guide to slow canvassing and things like that that can be used. And I know from going out to do canvassing that when you turn up, it's a bunch of the old stalwarts that are out there with a bunch of young people. And I know that they can't go up and down stairs and, mm. and in urban areas it's even worse so it would be great if we could work to kind of get people to pull their finger out mm. and get people to take on board it's not them and us it's all of us together yeah. sorry yeah. go ahead fran <laughs> okay. um becky you've already said about scrapping the work capacity assessments and the PIP assessments, which is certainly very, very much needed. And of course, the other part of that is the ministers who were responsible for bringing in those iniquitous things, including universal credit. And how do you think they should be brought to account for what they have done? Well, they're breaching the Human Rights Act. And, you know, that, that was the case in the UK courts. They've lost two appeals, for God's sake. And 
I think our job as a Labour Party is to bring this to the public fore so that people understand what's happening. And even, was it, was it last year, last November, it might have even been the year before, the UN did a report into what the Conservative government were doing and they called it a systematic immiseration of its people through its callous welfare policies. And it's deliberate because the Conservative Party don't want to have a system of social security. They want to have the poor and the deserving, the deserving poor and the non-deserving poor as if we were in the Victorian times, for God's sake. And that's not the kind of society that we're trying to build. And it's certainly not the society that the Labour Party has ever tried to build. So we've, and I don't think it's the kind of society that anyone in Britain wants. Everyone assumes until something happens to them, that they'll be all right, that the welfare state or the social security system, whatever you want to call it, that it'll be there to pick them up when they fall. And it's only when they have to rely on it that they realise that it very much isn't. And people get very angry about that because certainly people of a certain age, like my parents, for example, who grew up knowing that, you know, well, if they were able to work, they'd invest in the system. And then when they needed it, it'd be there for them. And that's how a lot of people felt about it. But for the next generations that came along, that story hasn't been told. And that's why it's not seen as national insurance or social security. And it's about rebranding it really to make sure that it's fit for purpose for the next generation that comes along. And we've not done a good job on that. We really haven't. We've called out stories that we found along the way that are shocking, but we've never really tried to make the case to sell this as a vital part of our constitution. Okay, thank Absolutely. you for that. Um, one of the whole issues for many of us who are disabled and therefore relying on benefits money is that there's actually a huge financial gap between what it costs to live as a disabled person and what it would cost for, say, an able-bodied person in the same situation because of all the extra things that we have to to pay for and manage within our lives just just to have some parity do you know how much that income gap is and what would you do to um reduce it well i don't know how much the the kind of average income gap is because it's all on personal circumstances and dependent on what you know assistance that you need but i think the problem with universal credit is that the additional top-ups if you like for severe disability allowance and there was another one i can't remember what it's called but it was part of the case of the, the two particular individuals who were in this appeal case today where it was removed as part of universal credit so the gap's getting even larger but the problem is is that the system's very complex anyway and it was complex before we even introduced universal credit and you had to fight tooth and nail for anything at all to try and get that extra support and assistance for the technologies or whatever it is that you needed to just deliver a decent standard of life. And it shouldn't be that hard. It should be a fundamental human right that if you need that assistance, then that will be provided for you. Because the whole job of government, in my view, is the betterment and the best quality of life for its people and every single policy decision that it makes, it should be doing that. And that's why I've said that, and this is kind of a separate issue really, but I wanted to scrap the House of Lords and replace it with an elected Senate. But one of the main priorities and remits of that elected Senate would be to assess every single piece of legislation against quality of life, against whether it makes people better off and against what it does for our environment. And I think that the same principles need to be applied in terms of any legislation that goes through relating to social security to make sure that every single thing that does happen is actually to improve and empower quality of life. Thank you. Just so that you know that financial gap is about £580 on average. God, that's crazy. Yeah, it's a massive amount of money. Yeah. Um, and of course one of the issues of that is that benefits have never ever had any form of triple lock in the same way no. that pensions have and no. so they have got progressively more and more behind and this is my last question on this part of the um, questions which is that many disabled candidates really struggle um, to get onto both long lists and shortlist for council and parliamentary seats. 
what will you do to ensure that disabled candidates will be included on every short list and every long list? I think we've, well, in the party we've done a lot in relation to women and having all women shortlists and that seems to be accepted that in order to get that level of representation we've got to have that positive discrimination if you like to make sure that it's enforced and I think the same thing needs to happen to make sure that we have that diversity so we've got disabled MPs not just the odd one which we've got at the moment and we celebrate that but it shouldn't just be the odd one um, and the same goes for BAME representation and making sure that we're really ensuring that the full diversity of our communities is represented and that's something that we can do through the democratic process in our party and rule changes to make sure that the NEC has power to enforce that there is a disabled person on every long list and not short list, frankly. Okay, thank you. I'm going to hand over to Cathy now for the next few questions. All yours, Cathy. And this becomes a little bit less <laughs> structured because I, I sometimes freewheel through the questions. <laughs> um, so just so you know, um, and I've been saying to this to every, we did uh, deputy candidates um, earlier, and I know that some of them I know and some of them I, I haven't met. I'm a labor counselor in Suffolk, um, and Sandy Martin was actually my group leader before he became an MP and unfortunately having lost him we're now at the mercy of uh, Tom Hunt who mm. has made his racist and uh, otherwise crass commentary and people seem to be quite willing to go there with things. Um, one of the things that I have found since becoming a candidate now at the time I ran for my first term in 2013. I, I was just newly to the point of trying to figure out about wheelchair using and things like that. And um, I, was, I was very lucky, our council, our Tory-led council had some really good staff in it and they made sure that I had everything I possibly needed in order to do my job as a county councillor. For that I was very um, grateful. But what I have found over a period of time is that when talking to other disabled people mm. they have a lot of fear and a lot of trepidation. And this leads me to my st thing of standing for office is prohibitively expensive for many disabled people. Will you champion a bursary scheme which will cover all reasonable adjustments for disabled candidates, whether they're standing as counselors or MPs to ensure that they can meet the expenses? of being a candidate yeah so that's no, the first <laughs> yeah no i think that's a really good idea and um i mean and this is right across the board really it's about making sure that we're you know because the problem with being a counselor is a really hard job but it's also it takes up a lot of your time a lot of people think oh yeah you know you can still have a full-time job you can still do all of the other things in your life and you can't and because of that, it means that we end up not being as diverse as we, we should be within councils. And mm -hmm. then the added problem of trying to make sure that everything is accessible to people who might struggle with it. You know, it could be infirm people because you want a whole range of people from young all the way up to older people on your councils and representing your communities. But they're not all great at doing their emails and being on the internet. They're not all great at being able to go around and knock on constituents doors because you know sometimes they're just not accessible and they can't do that and they do need extra support and then there's the extra support in campaigning as well 
and making sure that they're actually getting financial and physical assistance in being able to do that. Because again, even if you're just trying to become a candidate, that requires you going around all of the members and speaking to them and trying to forge relationships with them. And again, if you can't get out, you can't get into people's houses to do that. That gives an advantage to those who can, and that's not fair. So I do think it's a really good idea. And all support. Um, oh, great. Um, the other thing on top of that is because right now, especially with having universal credit, it's dis disproportionately affecting people um, who need to work if they're single parents mm. um, and you know those of us who are disabled who aren't working are more than willing to get involved in campaigns but they just because of the way universal credit is they their allowance is treated as income and the fact that they're actually there's no permitted work you immediately as you're starting to say that you're spending so many hours doing whatever it is mm -hmm. you live in fear that you're going to be spotted and i know that i've known a couple of people who have been involved in dpac mm -hmm. who are quite afraid of the fact that they're going to be spotted and reported to the DWP. We've had a lot of issues around knowing about Manchester Police and them using videotapes of disabled protesters mm. and forwarding them to the DWP. So you have people who ordinarily would put themselves up to be elected, but afraid that um, should the DWP find out that they're doing anything political and it doesn't happen to meet with the um, brand of government that you have, um, you can get severely pounded and punished mm. and they just can't take the risk. Yeah. So um, will you... I think you said this earlier, but the question is, will you support demands from the disabled people's movement and realizing our futures alliance for the National Independent Living Scheme and enshrining the UNCRPD Article 19 into UK law? Yeah, no, definitely. And I think it's absurd. I mean, we had one example. There's a girl in, in well, she's a woman, she'll call her a girl. Um, she's the same age as me. Um, and she, um, she's got, she had ME, or she's still got ME, so one day she'll be doing really, really well, and you know, you'd be thinking, oh yeah, she's not, she's not got problems, and then the next day she'll literally be flawed and she wouldn't be able to do anything at all. Um, she wanted to become a counsellor, and one of her fears was, as you say, was that as soon as she starts doing things and she's spotted going out and helping, then the assumptions drawn by somebody who might want to maliciously report her that there's nothing wrong with her and that she's actually capable of working when she isn't because one day she's fine and then the next day she isn't but equally she was worried that if she did become a counsellor she wouldn't get the support that she needed and the recognition that she might have fall down some days and she might be brilliant the next and that's why we've got to have that system in place but in terms of what you about the independent living scheme and the, the other UN um, element, I've got no problem supporting that at all. And any help, even if I don't win this leadership campaign, you know, any help that you would need from me to push that forward, I'd be more than happy to. Thank you so much for that. It's, it's just really nice to hear the candidates giving us, you know, their support regardless of what happens. And uh, it would be really appreciated. So how would you engage with disabled members so you can understand the injustices being experienced by disabled people and ensure their voices are heard and that all Labour Party policies are equally impact assessed? So I think there's a whole range of things that I kind of touched upon at the start, really. So the first point is making sure that you've got a disability officer in every single constituency party. And it's not just a cosmetic disability officer, it's somebody 
that can group together members, non-disabled members as well, because it's not just about having a group where disabled members go to talk to each other. The whole point of having that disabled officer is to make the rest of the membership aware of what's happening so that they can be informed in policy making. And then the second thing is about democratising our policy making process so that it's not just a case of waiting until you get to conference and you pass a motion so that when you go to your meetings and you've got accessible meetings, um, all the members feel that the point of going to those meetings is to feed into a policy making process and they receive political education and economic education around issues that are important to them to help them develop the skills and the knowledge to really pinpoint the policies that we need to develop. The other point is about the NEC and making sure that that position that was passed at conference actually is elected as quickly as possible so that there's an official voice on the NEC to push forward changes within the party but also changes within the policy making process. And then the last point is about making sure that all members of the Shadow Cabinet, when they're developing their own policies, which will go alongside a member-led policy-making process, that they have to take the issues on disability and the impact on the wider community into account, as you say, to impact assess them. We've talked a lot about environmental impact assessments on every department, but I think what you've raised is quite critical to have that equality um, impact assessment done as well, which we kind of always assume happens in the Labour Party, but it doesn't really. <laughs> and well, uh, I, f sure that that I find, I find that, um, especially as a councillor, hearing that a Tory council will not do an equality impact assessment because it's mm. not s statutory to do one. Um, so they will do things like get rid of bus routes and, and things like that. We're rural, so that immediately, if you're old, infirm, or unable to drive, mm. you're, you're automatically excluded from participation in just about anything. Mm. And, you know, this whole thing about people not understanding that the broadband thing is not just a thing about a giveaway, That's but right. it's, it's because the government and the DWP has made it so that everything is done online to cheapen the service, but there are people that are not able to apply for benefits because they can't log on to the internet because every form is online now yeah um, so that's I think we need to make people aware and I don't know yet how to do it if I find out I'll let you know um, can I just think about, really quick on, quick on that sorry Becky didn't mean to talk over you um, one of the things that, as you know, Kathy and I have been doing is meeting regularly with Don McDonald's office and with the other shadow ministers. Would you see the a way forward to allow more disability office disability advisors to work with um, shadow cabinet ministers on their varying groups? Because it's not, you know, disability affects almost every area. Exactly. No, I think it's a really good idea. I mean, John's, John's been brilliant. I've you know, worked with John on a lot of this stuff over the last few years. And, uh, and I think that that needs to be part of the course. You kind of assume that it is, but it isn't, unfortunately. But I think that's right. But on the broadband point, I just wanted to say about them, because one of the things that would get criticised for in the election campaign is the broadband pledge. And that, the only criticism that I've got of it is that it was kind of plopped in without us being able to develop the argument properly and say, well, the whole point of this is about inclusion because people aren't on the internet. You know, well, some people are, but a lot of people aren't. And with everything reducing service-wise, whether it's councils, whether it's DWP, you name it, most places don't have a phone number that you can ring anymore. And if you can't get out of your house anyway, then your only avenue is to go on the computer and to be able to do things. But if you haven't got super fast broadband and it takes you 10 hours to get through something, you can't do that. And then we didn't make the case about how by rolling out the broadband, it was going to improve productivity and investment as well. So, uh, so I still support the broadband, even though I'm sure a lot of my colleagues probably don't. <laughs> yeah, I think it would be something, 
uh, that you could say uh, as leader, should, should you be elected as leader, that you could actually say that, well, this is the reason why, and it's not me saying it, but it's a group covering, you know, people who are disabled who have to apply for many of these benefits. But not only that, it's single moms and all kinds of stuff, depending on what area you, you live in. Mm -hmm. I know of people within the center of Ipswich who are right next to one of the switching boxes. And because of planning, um, they're not allowed to connect to the box that's right out front of their house. So they don't have broadband. It's ludicrous. Okay, so um, many, okay, many disabled people, especially those with neurodiverse conditions, are adversely impacted within the current dysfunctional party complaint system. This applies to both making complaints and those who have had complaints made against them. Will you agree to work with the disabled members to ensure that they can be properly supported by advocates during the process. Yeah, definitely. And I think there's a lot of work going on um, on the, there's an APPG that John helped set up for neurodiversity as well, that's been covering a lot of these things that he's been championing because he keeps sending me the text messages whenever there's something going on. <laughs> so, so yeah, so I, I definitely think that that's something that should happen anyway. Okay. Um, and do you also accept that all outstanding complaints should be investigated and responses sent to both sides as soon as possible, seeing as several are long-lasting ones that people no haven't heard anything about? Yeah, and that's the problem with the whole complaint process overall, is that it wasn't, it wasn't fit for purpose in dealing with complaints quickly enough. And because there weren't enough staff that were working on it to deal with the number of complaints that were coming through because of the size of the party at the time, there were, it was not that there was loads more complaints coming through compared mm -hmm. to historically, it's just the size of the party grew, so the size of complaints grew as well. And then there was no structure to be able to deal with it. But you can't have a complaint that is dragging on indefinitely. And the respondent and the complainant themselves both deserve to know as quickly as possible what's happening because it causes a lot of mental anguish when things like this drag on. And especially with those who are neurodiverse, exactly. particularly because they look at things in a very linear fashion often. And if you tell them that there's a procedure that runs, you do this, then 10 days later you do that, and mm. 10 days later then you do that, they get totally thrown off, as mm. many do about the fact that they haven't gotten the letter and then they start emailing back and then the people in the office are saying well this person is just you know they're just a bombarding us with all kinds of irrelevant irrelevant stuff and it's only because of the nature of their particular disability that's causing that to get some kind of letter back that says okay it's moved from this stage to the next or yeah. we're holding for some information it it's just not happening at the minute okay so those are all of our prepared ones but we've been cheeky enough as as only we can be um to highlight a couple of things that we're aware of going on that would be really helpful to labor as, as a party. One of the things we think would be really appropriate is you have the, oh God, and Dawn said it today, but there's a grant scheme. You know, the Labor Women's Network has oh, yeah. Yeah. an education program yeah. Yeah. and there's one for, yeah, yeah, yeah. there's, Jim Cox and Bernie Grant. Yeah, and Bernie Grant. And having those two things, it would be really good if we also had one for LGBT 
if there isn't one, and for disability. Because one of the things is that the improvements that can be made for disabled people will actually make it a lot easier for everybody with a protected characteristic. Mm -hmm. So we'd like to work with you as leader to provide you with real experience of life driven education on disability on one side and also create an academy type situation not the english or the british version of academy but just having a, a process of sent having people apply to become leaders of tomorrow through gaining skills in social media and especially working with people who are neurodiverse as well to mm -hmm. teach them how to deal with being a leader and becoming an MP or a counselor and teaching them skills that need it. The other thing is that we would love to offer our services to help you write those things along the disability stuff and engaging other disabled people to, you know, wouldn't just be me and, and Fran or whoever on the executive, but reaching out and getting other disabled people together to write educational programs so that MPs and counselors and, and local CLPs know how to support disabled members and how that can benefit the whole is giving people the right education. So we'd like to offer you that. Secondarily, Fran and I went and became an instructor in mental health first aid because of a situation I ran into in a public meeting where um, a woman had a mental health crisis during the meeting and nobody knew what to do with her other than have the police that were there escort her to a, um, a safe place which happened to be in the lockup where she was traumatized already once for trying to take her life and because Suffolk has um, we have the record of how many times our um, our mental health system has gone into special measures. We're kind of like the yo-yo of the mental health world because um, we've been into special measures so many times and people can't get the help that they need. But I think the reason I went into it and one of the things that Fran and I talked about was we, saw the need for mental health first aid um, teaching. And we went out and financed ourselves to go and get that training. And we'd like to offer it to all MPs and all um, staff in offices across the country. We would like to help offer some of that training for MPs and counselors and anybody who and their staff members that actually are supporting people during this time that's going to lead up to when labor gets back into government. So um, that's the other cheeky plug that we'd like to make to you to make that happen so that we can train more people and turn around the vision of disabled member uh, disabled people from the demonization to make them bringing something positive into the labor party itself and that would be something we'd really like to offer and we would be saying that to each one of the candidates for leader and we would certainly whether 
you get elected or not. We would really like to work with you and the other members of the leadership team to be able to do these kind of things because there are things we can do really well. And we want to roll it out as far as possible so that people can live a healthier, more um, abundant life. And I know these next few years are going to be really difficult. And I can see, I have a very um, bad, as they say in Star Wars, I have a really bad feeling about this. And I think one of the things we can do is help MPs um, get the skills and their staff to get the skills they need to be able to manage their own mental health as well as those of the constituents that come mm -hmm. to see them. So that's the other thing. Fran? Yes. You I, have... Okay. Um, Mickey, have you got any questions that you wanted to ask us? No, I thought the mental health first aid training is a really good idea because, I mean, it's not just about um, helping MPs and the constituency offices because I know that my staff struggle because a lot of the people that come to see us have got mental health issues and it's either exactly. caused by a whole range of factors that are in their lives um, and they sometimes don't really know how to deal with them and I think being able to spot things and knowing how to respond in the right way and I mean they're all really good because they've been doing it for so long now that they, they kind of know how to kind of react and speaking to many of our members in the constituents who've helped them and said look you know it's like like when you talked about somebody with neurological neurodiversity it's like everything has to be structured and things like that for it to for, for, for everything to be calm and, and to sort stuff out so they know that but there's a whole range of things that they wouldn't understand and I wouldn't and we wouldn't know how to respond to and that would be really really helpful as well as making sure that all of our members in our constituencies understand so that they're there to help within communities because we don't have that help now and if you need mental health support you could be no. waiting on your waiting list for months even years oh, yeah. and you still won't get the support that you need so we have to be that first point of yes call. exactly and help that's why we want to help and then on the training schools i think that's really important so i wouldn't have been an mp if it wasn't for a training school and I went through my trade union training school and they said to me, oh, Becky, you know, you should think about becoming an MP. And I was like, oh, don't be stupid. And even, you know, myself, you know, and you might not think it now, but like way back then, you know, I didn't have the confidence to think that I could become an MP because I just didn't think that people like me did. And most of our members feel like that and they need somebody to help them exactly. and to hold their hands and to spot something in them and say no you know do this and if you want to do a speech we'll help you and we'll build up your confidence and you'll be on the road in no time and the same for becoming a counsellor as well and just trying to empower people because there's not that many people in the Labour Party who are pushy enough or bolshy enough there are a few of them but the, you know the <laughs> genuinely would put themselves forward because as socialists we never think like that and it's a bad thing it's a bad trait to be to be overconfident and be out there and like well I'm going to be an MP and I'm going to do this because everyone's like oh that they're a bit full of themselves them over there so you never do that we're all, we always act as a collective rather than as an individual but sometimes you need somebody to just give you that push and that's why the training school is so so important so anything I can do to help with that then you know do let me know yeah, well, we'll we'll make arrangements once whoever, if it's you, we will get in touch. We will make we will make sure that we stay in contact. And we've already started our disabled activist guide to the Labour Party. Would give you a lot of good information from our perspective. And it was our attempt to try to address some of those issues. So mm -hmm. if you'd like us to, if you don't have it, we'll send you a copy. Yeah, that would um, be good. Yeah. Just to make sure that you've got it in your hand one way or another. Because we, we're all going to be doing a lot more and it's going to get a lot darker before it gets a lot lighter for people, I think. I know it's going to be a horrible four or five years it really is but what we've got to do is 
instead of going down the negative road, we've got to help people where we can within our communities, but we've got to show them what the future is going to look like. And that's the only way we're going to win the general election is by showing that hope and making sure that all of our members, and this, this kind of ties into one of the reasons why I'm standing, I suppose, because when we saw that defeat in the election, I got so frightened that everything we'd fought for for the last five years, everything we believed in, it was as if somebody ripped it into pieces and told us that we weren't allowed to believe it anymore. And I knew that there wasn't anything wrong with our policies or what we were trying to do. We'd got it wrong in the election and Brexit obviously was a huge problem that took everything down with it. But we could never let our members think that what they believe in is wrong and we've got to fight for that. Otherwise, we won't have hope and we won't be able to build that society that we know can exist either. So, um, so our job now is to convince the members that it's possible and then to convince our communities that it's possible. And it's not radical. It's sensible and it's economic common sense to have a society where everybody does well and lives the best possible life that they possibly can. Because economically, when that happens, everyone's better off. Um, and the statistics show that, but I won't go off on a tangent talking about economics because we'll all fall asleep. But <laughs> One of the things that I found was missing as a, as a person who came over 20 years ago from the States, and we don't want to discuss that either, trust me. <laughs> but one of the things that we did that I was surprised didn't happen here was the fact that although there are individual councillors and MPs doing it individual bits of stuff, it's the community that doesn't see the work and the change. And I think if we did something along the lines of the good gym, where there's a, you know, they run from one place to another and they go and do something like tidying up gardens, they're sitting and talking to pensioners or any of those things. And that way people couldn't say, you only turn up when there's an election and you need my vote. Yeah. And I think that that would be the difference. And I think that if we could get our local branches and CLPs, not the same old faces, but all the new faces to invest into our local communities mm -hmm. and have the push from the top down of the leadership. I think that that would change a lot because I know it worked really well 30, 40 years ago in the States when that's what we would do. We wouldn't go out canvassing and door knocking. We'd just go out and pitch up and paint or rate, do a fundraiser or anything like that. And there's too much of this, this is the same old thing we always do. And it's not working. So we have to try something different. And that may be a way, and that's a freebie. I give that to you as an idea. Um, but I, I do think that that's part of the problem is people don't believe that the change can be made. Mm. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And one of, the, one of the things that I've been saying when I've been doing my little spiel kind of going around is about that community action. And the sad thing is, is that we've actually got loads of Labour members who are doing things in the community. But because we're socialists, we're a bit embarrassed to turn up to things and say, oh, we're Labour, look at me doing this. So no one ever knows that it's us that's doing it, if they're helping at a food bank, if they're doing a bit of a street tidy, like you said. So we've got to do it, but we've got to be visible doing it as well so that people understand that the community is the Labour Party. And you're right, because what they do see is us going around when it's time for an election and doing a bit of door knocking or doing a bit of a kind of food bank drive in a supermarket outside. And that's, what, that's all they think we do, and, and it's not. We're way more than that. Um, so I think making sure we're highlighting what we're doing, but I like this kind of like community action groups and making CLPs actually go out and do things and mandating them to have, you know, even if it's just monthly community events where they go and do stuff. Because that's in a food bank mm. or, or give their time to help support people 
who can't get in to see the CAB because there isn't a CAB locally yeah. or that, you know, they can't get in because there's so many other people. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to be like the rescue squad parachuting into communities and shouting about it because that's, uh, I think that's, I know that the Missouri is the show me state in the US and that's what we need to do. I know that British people generally, and I'm gonna make a, a really, um, it's kind of judgmental, but it's not meant to be, is that every, British people are really good with being stiff upper lip in adversity, but they're not good about advertising the good that they do and talking about the good that they do. And we really need to be doing that mm. because if we don't shout about it, I know nobody else will. Oh. So that's the other thing. So okay. I'll go back into my hole now. <laughs> you squad, I like it. Becky, thank you very, very much for your time today. I'm really grateful that you've engaged with us. It's been really, really good to have this conversation. And I'm now going to formally end this interview. So thank you very much. Oh, thanks, ladies. It's been an absolute honour. Thank honest. you. That's okay. Becky, before you go, I would like to ask you a question off the record, please. Yeah, go on. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is something that has really bothered me. I have been aware of some of the difficulties that have gone on within staffing and within, uh, and shall I say comments about bullying within certain members of staff within the leader's office. Right. I think you can probably work out where I'm coming from on this one. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to know how you had felt about what had happened and how you would change things to make sure that that did not continue. Because I've been bullied by at least one of those people. The problem, and this is what I've always said about that workplace that we call Parliament, is that it is like no workplace I have ever been in in my entire life. And the thing with staff is that it's so temporary so like, for example, the staff that were working on my team on the shadow business brief, they're only employed while I'm the shadow business secretary. So as soon as I'm not, they've all lost their jobs. Yeah. And the same goes for everyone that worked in Jeremy's office as well. So then you get people in who they're there because they're dedicated, because they believe, but they don't have a quality of life because they can't plan. They probably can't go and buy a house if you want to buy a house because they don't know if they're going to have a job, you know, in the near future because it could all come tumbling down around them. So you've got that environment to start with. And then add to that the fact that you've got to work around the clock 24 hours a day and it's stressful and it's nasty and all you're getting is abuse. You know, whether it's coming from the Tory party, sometimes it's coming from within your own party and you're trying to deal with it all the time and it creates that toxic atmosphere and it's not right for staff to have to work in that environment. And, and, and I know it's difficult because in politics, you know, it's always going to be like that to an extent, but I think that there does need to be more put in place to protect people. Um, and I know that the trade unions, you know, within the Labour Party, certainly within the staffing kind of the leaders office and around them have been trying to work to protect the staff more, but it still needs to come from the leadership as well. And they can't let that happen. And there needs to be more structure and more chains of command and accountability and things like that, which is difficult in a political environment, because if you're a political activist, you just want to go on and get on with your own thing. And sometimes when you achieve things, it is because you have to be a bit bolshy and a bit browbeaty and stuff like that. But that and being, you know, in a place of employment don't tend to marry together very well. And um, it needs to be sourced out. And it's not just within the Labour Party. This is right across Parliament. The whole culture needs to change. Would you, see well, your, I think, would you see yourself changing some of the way that the leader's office has been run for the last few years? I mean, don't get me wrong, Jeremy's done the most amazing job. And we've actually just had a really lovely thank you letter from him, which yeah. has arrived in my email box today for all the work that DL has done, and particularly for the personal support we've given him, um, which is, as far as I'm concerned, has been absolutely unquestioning. He's been an amazing leader and he's going to be He's going to be a hard act to follow, that's for sure. Um, but I wondered how you would 
you know, change things within that office to make sure that, you know, life was better for everybody. I think you've got to have more structure. Um, and because I'm quite kind of, I come from, you know, a legal background. So I'm used yep. to everything being structured and efficient. And that's why it was quite a bit of a kind of shock to the system when I came into politics and it wasn't like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Oh. No, I, I worked in a barrister chamber, so look, I understand where you're coming from. So, so yeah, so I mean, it'd have to be far more structured, but I think that there needs to be those mechanisms in place, A, through having trade unions, but also having clear management structures so that if there are problems and staff are feeling that they're being bullied or abused, that there's a clear structure where they go through to make complaints and that those complaints are addressed. Um, and it has to be like in any organisation, it has to be done in a way where they can go to someone that isn't their manager and that complaint exactly. processed yeah. properly so they don't feel that it's detrimental on their career or their job or whatever's happening and you know we, we, we try to have those processes in the Labour Party but sometimes when you're in a fast-paced political environment like that sometimes it doesn't work out like that and as soon as somebody sticks their head above the parapet everybody knows who they are and then the persona non grata and then it becomes even more difficult for them. And there's the party that's meant to be there for the workers to protect them. We've got to have the gold standard. So, yeah, so mm -hmm. I'd say more structure, a, a, a separate complaints process. There was even talk about having a completely separate complaints process from the parties within Parliament for members of staff as well, so that they could whistleblow. Because it's not just about the leaders, office, it's about people working for MPs as well. Because they're like, you know, you've got 650 separate offices, yeah. with separate bosses and separate groups of staff and they don't have anywhere to go to because their boss is the MP. Mm. So they need to have that avenue where they can make them complaints, otherwise nothing will ever change and abuse is going to continue. I think also that I don't know because I don't know the ins and outs of the structure at that level because I've only visited. But um, as far as the actual Labour Party, how much influence does the leader actually have on the, you know, people at Southside that aren't in the leader's office, but are working in other parts of the Labour Party? How much influence does the leader and the deputy leader have? So I don't think they have direct legal control, as far as I understand. That is done through the General Secretary, who's elected by the NEC, and then they make all of the decisions. But the convention is, is that basically whatever the leader wants, if they try to change things, then the you know, South Side and the General Secretary has to be amenable. But that doesn't always happen, as we know from experience. Um, mm. And, uh, and, you know, that's something that the NEC probably needs to examine, really. I mean, you don't want a leader that's able to become authoritarian and start completely chopping and changing every five minutes. Absolutely. But the you still want the leader to have some level of authority and, you know, input into what's happening at Southside, because you can't have a Southside that's working completely independently from what the leader's trying to set out and do. Absolutely. Well, I think I think they would meet their match yeah. in yourself <laughs> as leader. Yeah. I I get that feeling. Yeah. So, well, see, this is why we need structures in place because I probably would become one of them authoritarian leaders who wants to tell everyone what to do. So, <laughs> <laughs> but that would just be to raise your comfort level because <laughs> it can't be an easy thing for a leader. And that would be what we would love to include you if you get time at some point in one of our mental health first aid um, courses. Yeah, that would we'll, be mean. Because I think that would give you the tools that you would need in order to um, support your mental health as well as the people around you. And I think as leader that I couldn't think of a better way to demonstrate the commitment to mental health and well-being than to have the leader take a course. Yeah, no, that's a good idea. I'll need that help, I tell you. And we will, we are very good at reorganizing our things to meet with yeah. people's needs. 
So there would be a way for you to get the qualification without having to have block out two full days because we know that ain't going to happen. That's brilliant. Well, we would definitely work with you on that. Becky, we've taken up more than enough of your time. I'm sure you need to be back in the house to vote and do all sorts of other things. Oh, no, I'm, not, I'm just sat in the kitchen. All right. Oh, lovely. <laughs> so, oh, my, you so love it. The boy's bedtime story, so it's good timing because he goes to bed ah, at eight o'clock. Right. <laughs> How old is your little one? He's seven. All right. Oh, bless him. So still at the age of loving story time with mum. Yeah, he'll grow out of that soon. Oh. <laughs> And you look, hey, look, go and enjoy your time with your son and take care and the very best of luck.